and to see your private doctor is unfortunately not feasible for most people to spend quality time with them. You don't get quick appointments. You don't get to ask all the necessary questions. So born was concierge medicine for those people that valued a relationship with their physician. Hi, and welcome to the Lumina Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Gilder. On this podcast, we'll explore how to achieve and plan for a long, healthy life, as well as how to prepare for the inevitable and unforeseen through estate planning, insurance, and end-of-life decisions. We'll talk candidly with experts who advise high and ultra high net worth clients so you can learn how to apply their strategies and tactics to your own longevity and legacy planning. Hi, Ian, Dr. Rusinoff. It's great to have a conversation with you. I've been really looking forward to this one. I am personally kind of contemplating whether I should start finding a concierge doctor. And then I realized I don't even know what concierge doctors do. I'm the son of a physician. Uh, unfortunately, my father passed away about 14 years ago, so I couldn't call him up and ask him what his take on it is, but maybe you can enlighten me and just start at the very beginning, first principles. What is concierge medicine? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me, Justin. I really appreciate it. Uh, concierge medicine essentially is a relationship. Uh, what's really missing from medicine these days, really in the primary care world, is a relationship. So concierge medicine came about probably 20 years ago or so. Medicine has changed over the years. It's very dominated by insurance companies. Doctors and patients can't spend a lot of time together. They get lost in the shuffle. And to see your private doctor is unfortunately not feasible for most people to spend quality time with them. You don't get quick appointments. You don't get to ask all the necessary questions. So born was concierge medicine for those people that valued a relationship with their physician. Okay. And so take us back to your start. What led you to being a concierge doctor um, and both professionally, but also education. So everybody listening okay. can understand, you know, who you are and where your expertise comes from. Yep. I, I definitely have had a different path than most. So I am actually a board certified emergency medicine physician. I went to school in Brooklyn, New York, SUNY downstate. And I did my residency and training on the Upper West Side of Manhattan at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, which is part of Mount Sinai. And um, I was a board certified emergency medicine physician. I uh, graduated residency in 2005. My wife and I, we moved to Florida at that time. My first job out of residency was at a level one trauma center in Fort Lauderdale, where I became the assistant director. From there, I went to the Cleveland Clinic, which is a, more of a tertiary center, complex care I was the vice chairman of the emergency department there, and I left Cleveland Clinic in 2021 to be the medical director of a company called Solace Health, which is a concierge medical practice in, uh, in Florida. So Solace Health has locations in New York, California. They were building Florida. I became the medical director, and my responsibility was to really grow the market. And we had locations in Palm Beach and in Miami. We, uh, we grew the Palm Beach market from zero members to 2,500 members in a little over a year. So where you see the desire to just be a part of a concierge practice and have immediate access to care and relationships with your doctors. But through that, what I formed uh, was relationships with patients. I never had that as an emergency medicine physician. My job in the emergency department was basically to treat and treat, diagnose and stabilize, not an emergency we sent it out, follow up with your doctor. I've taken care of everything, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, car accidents, heart attack, cardiac arrest, COVID, seizures, infections, pneumonia. I mean, everything, uh, diverticulitis, acute abdominal emergencies. But uh, when I got to Solace Health, even though our bread and butter is really more urgent and emergent care, it, it, it was really more of a concierge care. We were a one-stop shop, a do-it-all for the patients, members at any time. And I really found a passion for getting to know the patients and uh, building a relationship. So it was pretty eye-opening for me because for the first 16 years of my career, it was just all about, I, I hate to say it was all about volume, but I could see 50, 60. I once saw 75 patients in a 12-hour shift, left, I felt fine, went out to dinner, went to the gym. It was routine. 
And uh, really what was missing from that in retrospect was just the time and the relationship with the patient. So at Solace Health, I started to have that relationship, uh, giving out my cell phone, speaking to people outside of work, and just participating in our members' healthcare. And quite frankly, it's a pleasure to participate in our members' healthcare. And uh, it's different. You know, at Solace, you learned like sometimes it's a patient in the sense that they come in, they're sick, they need urgent or emergent care. And other times they're a member just looking for advice, just with a question, but they've truly trusted me with their health. And along that process, I met a great doctor, Dr. Goldstein, who has a, a longstanding concierge internal medicine practice in West Palm Beach. She asked me to join her practice. She's a solo provider for over 400 patients. So she asked me to join her practice as uh, her partner, which I did. And uh, now I'm building up my side of the practice. So I've taken the lessons and the knowledge I've learned at Solace to kind of just a new territory where now I have the opportunity to, to grow this practice and really treat my members and patients with the time, dignity, honesty, and respect that really they deserve and that I want to, you know, provide. Yeah, that's a, it's an amazing change in medicine. I can uh, only say from an outsider's view, but I remember as a child hearing my father complain about the inability to spend enough time with his patients, even though he was in private practice for yeah. himself. And so what is the reason that drives patients to concierge medicine? When you hear them talk about their prior experience, yeah. what, what are some of the top reasons? Yeah. So, so, and I'll just take a step back. So with my path being through the emergency department, which is again, not the traditional path because my, I'm, I'm board certified in emergency medicine, even though I have now the experience and the skills to help and, you know, practice internal medicine, the more traditional path is you have doctors that are trained in internal medicine or family medicine, and they've ran a busy office and they'll have patient volumes of, you know, a, a census of 2,500 patients. And when you have that many patients, you can't get them in the same day or next day. You can't spend, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes or an hour. You can't take phone calls at all times of the day. So the more traditional route is you had one of those, those practices, 2,500 members, and you couldn't spend time with your patients. It just was not feasible. You, you have to pay the bills. The insurance companies reimburse very little. So to make that happen, you had to put five, six people, four or five, six people on your schedule in one hour. And there is just no time to really properly evaluate and get to know your patient. There's just no relationship um, at that clip. Now you will find some people that will say, oh, I have a traditional doctor and he, give, he or she gives me their cell phone number. That may be the case for certain patients, but I can guarantee that not all patients have the cell phone. <laughs> and it's just a very different way of... Uh, structuring the practice. So in concierge, you limit your practice size. I mean, there's a magic number. It's different for everybody, but it's somewhere from 300 to 500. You know, that's the range, which is the number that should allow the physician to provide ample time to their patients. And included in that with concierge, the expectation is same day appointments or next day appointments if it's late in the day, access to their cell phone to ask any questions at any time of the day, uh, advocacy, so someone's going to be in the hospital, whether you're the admitting doctor or just you're under a different service, but you will advocate as the doctor for your patients in the hospital. Um, expedited follow-up appointments. We all have our relationships and preferred contacts. So when my patients need expedited appointment to cardiology, GI, orthopedics, I have my own personal relationships that I will ask for help or assistance or guidance or just advocate for quicker care. And, and that's what people are technically paying for. It's, I, I often get uncomfortable, like, you know, even describing what it is, because this is born out of the, like the problems in the healthcare system. If the healthcare system in America was better, everybody would be able to have this kind of treatment. Like, sadly, when people, you know, ask me how much it is per year, or what's the membership like, I, I'm almost embarrassed because you know, I, I want to take care of everybody and do the right thing for my patients. But if you have too many, you can't, you can't give the proper attention that they need. But this is a consequence of health insurance and just like a difficult, broken healthcare system. So it sounds like kind of terrible, but most people prefer to go to Universal Studios or Disney with a fast pass.
or some guarantee that they're going to get on the rides. This is essentially in many aspects, like a fast pass for your healthcare. And ultimately what's more important than your healthcare. I mean, we both, I'm sure know lots of people who spend money on vacations and houses and cars, but you know, you can't enjoy your wealth without your health. So this is a way that members, and that's what I guess, you know, we'll get into the topic of longevity for those that value their health, which will allow them to enjoy their wealth. They kind of have to go the route of concierge medicine to get the attention and detail, the attention to detail that they, that they really deserve. Yeah. So before we go over to talking about longevity, uh, spend a bit more talking about the current healthcare system, not just in the structure, which I think you've touched on in terms of insurance and, um, you know, the wait times or perhaps the volume of patients that doctors have to see, but also outcomes, patient outcomes, because I'm wondering whether concierge medicine is able to also improve outcomes for patients. And is that a driving force also? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could tell you anecdotally from my time at Salas Health, I mean, we were greatly able to improve patient outcomes by offering them expedited access to appointments and to care and just having somebody help them navigate a difficult system. We we have connected in doctors, or I don't even want to say connections. We have relationships with doctors where someone, even if it's a colonoscopy, we had a patient who thought they were going in for a routine colonoscopy and they, they diagnosed lymphoma. We've had mm. members who are, were in the hospital and just, they had nobody to advocate for them. They're admitted to a hospital or service. And, you know, we got involved through the solace health approach as, as a team. And we, we coordinated a transfer in, in a, like a difficult transfer, because usually you need a primary care doctor involved to, to kind of expedite and coordinate that. But we were able to do that. So I would say that there are many health benefits to having access to concierge care. Um, we're able to do quicker labs, quicker turnaround times at, at Solace Health. And I, again, that's where I came from. So I recently made this transition, but we have the ability to do CAT scans and x-rays and blood work. And we would see people with chest pain who undoubtedly would be admitted to a hospital for two, three days while they're doing blood works and waiting on tests. We, we could turn that around in less than an hour and coordinate an outpatient appointment safely. So a person didn't have to spend a day wow. or two in the hospital, pick up a hospital acquired infection, be away from their family, be away from their pets. It, it, it really, it, it improves outcomes dramatically, dramatically. Now, is there evidence or literature that will say like, oh, if you have a concierge doctor versus a traditional doctor, Will you live longer? Will you hold off heart disease you know, longer? Will you not get cancer? I, I don't believe that evidence exists because it's going to be very hard to quantify or to measure. But again, you have to get to know your patients, know who wants these types of screenings. We'll talk about longevity. Longevity is not cheap. There's a lot of longevity doctors out there right now. And they're kind of like celebrities. I mean, they're physicians, but they have like celebrity-like followings when they speak. And if you really want to stay ahead of your of your health and do things proactively and get this updated information, whether that's, you know, advanced cancer screening tests, whole body MRIs, it's not covered by insurance. So again, back to the system being broken, there are advantages for people, you know, the wealthy and mm -hmm. people who are willing to spend the money on their health, because this is where insurance comes into to play and they limit what they will cover. So it really is, you know, a free for all out there because money kind of helps people get these tests, which can help them diagnose diseases quicker or earlier, which will ideally improve their chances of surviving a potentially fatal disease. Because like anything, whether it's heart disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, if you could diagnose it quicker, you have a better chance of treating it earlier, curing it sooner and living longer and healthier. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, like it or not, we're a capitalist society. And so solutions like this do come from, uh, you know, the system that we live in. And so it's great, actually, uh, that we have this flourishing concierge health medicine. Perhaps the underlying structural challenges need to be addressed by society writ large. But for this conversation, we'll focus in on the concierge medicine and the folks that have the, you know, fortune, both actual fortune and good luck to be able to, you know, utilize their wealth to improve their health. 
So let's talk about longevity in that regard. Let's define longevity first before we kind of talk about how people achieve it and how they can utilize a concierge doctor to help them achieve that. When I say longevity or you say longevity, what do we mean by that term? Yeah, I mean, longevity simply is going to mean living a longer life. I mean, it's pretty, the word longevity is very simple. It's just living longer. But that really is not or should not be the goal. Like most people don't want to live longer. They want to live better. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you just don't want your last stages of life to be in a steady, depressing decline. Like ideally, we would like all be healthy, 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 and then like dead. Like death is inevitable. And what we don't want is to just be in a steady decline for many years. So the focus is, and you'll hear this from certain physicians and they, you know, are very popular and well sought out about lifespan and health span. But simply put, we want to live as we do want to live as long as we can, but we want to be healthy to enjoy that life, to be in a wheelchair, to be pushed around, to be dependent on people, to you know, not be able to make it to the bathroom, to have to ask for assistance with all of our activities of daily living is not how most of us want to spend our final days. So longevity, while it simply is just how long you live, I I think most people don't necessarily want to just live longer. They want to live longer and better. So they kind of go hand in hand. Right. And so I think that term now these days is health span. Right. Uh, or that's a term that's gathering meaning and resonance in the marketplace of ideas. Yes. So if we're yeah. thinking about maximizing health span, uh, so we're living longer and living better, and a patient comes in to start a relationship with you, how do you start assessing where they are? Like, What are some of the ways in yep. which you need to gain both qualitative and quantitative data to assess their current status? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, It's a great question because I have patients slash members of all different ages and at all different stages of their health. So there are certain people that are very interested in this longevity, wellness, holding off diseases. They're very well-read and learned and knowledgeable about this topic. And, you know, I will have a discussion with them about like, are we going to do the, the longevity, the longevity thing? Are we looking to, to be proactive and stay ahead of your health? And if they're interested and engaged, I am happy to go down that road with, with the patients. Some of them, they're already coming into the practice with high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, a history of cancer. That's a very different discussion than someone who is, say, young and healthy with no medical problems. So I actually, I mean, I had a young patient sign up for my practice who has no medical problems, takes no medicines. And she asked me, you know, am I wasting your time? As, and I said, I just hope like I'm not wasting your money. I said, because you are like, by all accounts, young and healthy and have no medical needs. You're in your 20s. But what it did is it allowed us, and again, for this person who's price insensitive, it allowed us to order, say, certain tests, advanced cholesterol panels. We discussed, you know, things like a whole body MRI and cancer screening, um, nutrient analysis, the gut biome. Is she predisposed to things like dementia or Alzheimer's disease? So it allowed us to have these conversations and allowed her to be comfortable with like, where will this go and what trajectory like will this follow? So even at a young age, that's kind of the demographic that they're looking into this longevity. I, I don't want to say it's a program because it's not a, there's not like one recipe for or a one size fits all like the longevity package. There are an endless amount of tests that you could do that, and they're quite ambiguous, nonspecific markers of inflammation, fancy cholesterol tests that don't just give you like our number. We're used to hearing about the total cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, the good cholesterol. You could break it down into like a a pattern type, a cholesterol particle size. You could break it down, you know, a hundred which ways, and it's, it's really endless. So as long as like the patient slash member is on the same page, for me, I just appreciate the opportunity to partake in their health and look forward to being either the leader or the quarterback of keeping them healthy for many years to come. But it's really got to be very personality dependent. 
like the, the topic of like, should I go for a whole body MRI comes up quite frequently. You'll see it. You'll see it advertised. People will, will ask about it. If someone has anxiety or they're very preoccupied or worried about their health, they have to understand that if they go for a whole body MRI, which is an extremely sensitive imaging study, I mean, it's really detailed. They're not going to get a, a paper that comes back and says normal. They are going to get like many pages of a report that says there is something, you know, in the adrenal gland, there is something very small in the liver. You have to know what you're looking at or what the expectation is up front. And those are great starting points or a baseline. But if you're willing to do that and to take that first piece of information with, you know, some optimism and understand that it's the baseline, then this could be a really great, you know, relationship and, and process to staying ahead of your health. Yeah. There was an article this week in the Washington Post about a whole body body MRI that detected, I believe it was a two millimeter growth in a relatively young woman's pancreas. And it turned out it was stage one pancreatic cancer, which, you know, I'm a lay person, but I had never heard of anybody finding stage one pancreatic cancer. And this woman's life, life was saved. Obviously not all outcomes are like that, but that was powerful anecdotal yep. evidence for me personally to start considering this. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to hear case reports of like amazing stories. And, and some of these cancer screening tests, they will have, you know, amazing stories and it'll be plastered on their website. Why everybody does this. The, you know, the flip side of it is that some of these tests, while I do support them in the right patient population, the right demographic, they can be like very anxiety provoking to patients. So you just have to have that discussion like upfront. And as long as your expectations are on are aligned and on the same page, I think it could be a beautiful thing. Yes, I understand what that is because I had uh, I have a history of cancer in my family, and I underwent some genetic testing for some precancerous uh, markers, and at least one was found, but it was to be yet identified by medicine. So they don't know what it really predisposes me to, which definitely created a bit of anxiety. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, I just said, well, they don't know. What am I going to do about it? I'm going to forget about it. Right. Well, but the other thing is like, you now know, like if you're signing up for one of those tests, you have to understand that it may need to be followed periodically with screening mm -hmm. tests, whether that's an x-ray or a CAT scan or an ultrasound, a nuclear study, an MRI. So as long as those expectations, like I mean, like any like any relationship, having clear expectations as early as possible is the best is the best approach. So as long as you knew going into this that that was one of the potential outcomes, it's just then it's a good onset. But I definitely have certain patients, and like certainly like my mother, she would not be an ideal candidate for any of these potential nebulous screening tests that don't give a clear cut exact diagnosis because it would be anxiety provoking to her. Uh, that's understandable. Uh, so if we're this kind of hypothetical patient that is relatively healthy, doesn't have any of these uh, conditions that are acute that are bringing them in to see a doctor, what are some of the health metrics that they should be testing for or focused on at the beginning? And I know that you said there's untold number of tests, but if we had to pick a top few yeah. that would be informative, what would those be? Yeah. I mean, it varies by age. It varies by, you know, male versus female. You know, there's always going to be the cancer screening tests, you know, for both male and female. Women should get a mammogram starting at age 40. Colonoscopy is now recommended for both, you know, at age 45. Prostate cancer screening, that's that's a little bit of a controversial one because the science and the data, you know, it's, it's different like who you ask. Like we all agree there should be some screening, but, you know, the urologists may differ from the oncologists who may differ from the internal medicine type doctors lung cancer screenings. So based on your age, your past medical history, uh, certain demographics, there will be cancer screening. But as a general population, I mean, your labs, which is your basic CBC, your chemistry, which is your liver, your kidneys, your electrolytes, possibly thyroid tests, you know, the PSA involves cancer, the hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of, you know, do you have prediabetes or diabetes? These are certain tests that are commonly ordered by your general doctor and will be followed over time. The cholesterol screening tests as well. 
vitamin levels like vitamin D, you know, that's important, especially as we get older for osteoporosis and your risk for fracture. So we're going to look at certain tests um, as a, you know, standard tests, like regardless. And then again, if the patients are interested in this much more um, sophisticated approach, there would be another level of testing. And then you will see advertised other companies that will offer tests that you will get 500 labs or a thousand labs. And again, same thing with having clear expectations, like what are you exactly going to do with this information? But it could get really out of control. But but the CBC and the and the blood chemistries, you know, the urine every once in a while. And, and it's not like you're looking for like a, a urinary infection. You're looking for things like protein in the urine, or you could detect things like diabetes in the urine. Those are pretty much like the standard tests that you should expect. But I will say, like labs are in everything. Like I hear people say, oh, I, I need to go to my doctor for my annual exam because I need labs. You know, really, I, I find it just more valuable to see the person over time, their weight, their demeanor, their mental health, their their affect. Are, are they now, do they seem a little bit depressed? Or is everything okay at home? And, and the labs are just really one part of the picture. Like people love labs because it's objective. Mm -hmm. You know, as a physician for many years, it's the subjective stuff that is probably more valuable and, and worthwhile for me. And it's like, I do the labs really as a matter of fact, because we, we have to know the baseline and you will get information, but really because it's an objective measure, but the subjective nature of just having that relationship and seeing your patients and seeing how they are over time holds, holds a lot of value. So hanging on some of the objective data for a moment, I've heard of a few that I'd love to hear your take on, or just maybe an explanation about how important or relevant they are. Sure. Uh, advanced lipid tests and a CAC score. And those are some things that through my own research have popped up and I'm just thinking, you know, should I consider those? And if somebody's listening, they may also be wondering, should they consider those types of tests? So a CAC score, like a coronary, like the calcium scores. So advanced lipids and, and the calcium score. So two things, the advanced lipids, um, I, I asked the patients what they, you know, do you want to do this? The, the advanced lipid, the downside is it's not covered typically by insurance. So there's a, a not, it's, it's not a, a really outrageous fee. It could be 20 bucks. It could be up to 120 bucks. Um, I asked the patients if they want this information and, you know, if they're willing to do it. I am a believer in it. You, you're looking for things, what's called like LP little a or lipoprotein A, you, and you may have heard of these things. ApoB, which is uh, another lipoprotein, like the traditional cholesterol test was you get like the total, you get what's called the LDL, you get the HDL, which is like classically the good, the bad, you'll get the triglycerides. I mean, you basically get five numbers. But what we what we do know is there is more information to be determined from these advanced lipid tests. So if somebody's like on the fence with their total cholesterol and they have what's called like an elevated like LP little a, like lipoprotein A or ApoB, they kind of have a genetic predisposition to have high cholesterol. And knowing that, say, they're on the fence with uh, their other labs, you may choose to be more aggressive about treatment. And treatment doesn't have to be meds. I mean, it could be lifestyle changes, diet and exercise and certain modifications. It could be certain supplements like, you know, red yeast rice or things. It doesn't have to be like a, a medicine, not all co like high cholesterol equals start medication therapy, but you will have this information at your disposal to kind of like be the wake up call or the kick in the ass if you need to maybe make those lifestyle changes. So I do think that the advanced lipid panel is, is beneficial because again, I, I think most people don't change like their way or their habits until they have like a little bit of a scare. And sometimes that just comes from a blood test. Like it shouldn't have to be chest pain or stroke-like symptoms or ending up in a hospital with, you know, an overnight stay and a miserable experience to say, I'm going to get, you know, ahead of my health. It, it could be a blood test that will say, look, my father had heart, you know, heart disease and high cholesterol. My grandfather had it. I'm 40, even though I'm eight, then I have this elevated blood test, which is only detected on the advanced panel maybe I need to start worrying about my cholesterol because really it's one of the few things we could do to hold off cardiovascular disease and, and, and stroke health or, or brain health, if you will, to prevent heart disease and strokes. So I am a fan of the advanced lipid testing because again, I, I don't like to do a test just for the sake of doing it. 
but I do think it allows you to have that discussion with your with your patient about possibly changing the treatment plan and being more aggressive. With the calcium score, this is a little bit of a tricky one because you will a, a calcium score is basically somebody will go in for a CAT scan of their chest. It's a low dose CT scan. It's not a ton of radiation. It's it's a very quick test. It takes a few seconds. And it will basically, the computer will generate a number as to how much calcium is in your coronary arteries. And people use that as a surrogate or as a marker that is their heart disease presence. It doesn't tell you if there is a blockage or a narrowing of the artery. It doesn't tell you if you know, you're going to have a heart attack. But most people don't want to see calcium in their arteries. It's kind of assumed that if there's calcium, the arteries must be, must be harder thicker and the blood won't flow through as smoothly and you are at risk for a higher you're at higher risk for a heart attack or or a cardiac event I should say so everybody wants a score of 0 and you know that's like the goal like you get a score of 0 you're like there's no calcium and uh you know you're good to go but unfortunately we will see some people have scores in the hundreds i mean you want it under 100 you want it under 300 it really needs to also be taken into like you know clinically correlated with your age, history of diabetes, history of hypertension. Are you a smoker? Do you have a family history? But everybody is looking, you know, for a score of zero for that reassurance that they don't have heart disease. It's it's essentially one piece of the puzzle is what I have to say. It's essentially one piece of the puzzle. You have a low risk patient who, you know, has a calcium score of zero and they have great cholesterol and they're otherwise healthy. It's reassuring. Great. You have no calcium. Go about your life. We'll recheck it down the road. But if you have, you know, those risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, family history, and you're over, say, 65, I don't really find that there's, you know, 55, 65, 75. It doesn't even matter if you have the risk factors. I'm not a believer then that the CT calcium score is very reassuring. If you had the risk factors and, you know, so the markers that you're predisposed to this disease, I would prefer a, a test that really gave us some you know, some objective information about your coronary arteries or the functioning of your heart. So namely, um, it would be called the CTA, which is a coronary CTA. It's a CAT scan that actually looks at the patency of your arteries or mm. something to the effect of a stress test. And that could be done where I'm sure everybody knows you get either on a treadmill or you walk, or it could be through like a nuclear, like an injection. But that will give you like clear indications and parameters if there is actually heart disease. So the CT calcium score, you know, again, in a low risk patient, it is a test that has some utility to make the patient feel better about where they currently are. And again, it's a baseline. So if you understand that you're using this as a baseline, let's say you got this test, you're, you have a score, say, of 20. And then over, you repeat that test in a couple of years. You know, and now you're went from a 20 to a 200 or a 500. You know, it kind of helps prognosticate and stratify where someone may may land. So again, there's value, and like anything, it just needs to be taken in context to other factors. So it's not an end all be all. It's essentially one piece of the puzzle. Okay. Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, you mentioned a stress test there, and I personally have uh, recently started focusing a little bit more on cardio exercise. I went out and got myself a heart rate monitor, have started monitoring my workouts, but I realize I have no idea what my max heart rate is. And so therefore, yeah. I don't know what to do with the data, which sounds like a lot of these tests, you need somebody there to help interpret and guide. What is the usefulness of the stress test? And you know, do you use that as a tool with your new patients and on an ongoing basis? Yeah, I mean, the stress test is really where you're looking for patterns on a stress test that predict if you actually have coronary artery disease. So you're hooked up to like an EKG machine and leads. And as the heart rate goes up, you will see changes on the EKG that predict if there are blockages in your arteries. So you're looking mm. for patterns that will kind of, and, and through those patterns, you could kind of guesstimate, is it the right coronary artery? Is it the left main? Is it the left anterior descending? You could kind of, you know, pr you know, predict with pretty good 
accuracy where the blockage may lie. So the stress test is a much more sophisticated test than just looking at your heart rate. Now, I will say, like, let's say someone, and I'm just going to make this up, like it's 50 years old, and, and they'll tell you that they go exercise and they notice not just that their heart rate, when, when they exercise, their heart rate's going to go up. But if they start to follow like a pattern, like I exercise for like four or five minutes, and now I get winded, I get short of breath, I have to stop, I clutch my chest, it goes away in five, 10 minutes, this is occurring more frequently. Uh, that person to me, that is a stress test without being hooked up to like leads or an EKG or Bashid. That already is telling you that they've, they're failing a stress test and they even need more than that. So, you know, in speaking with like my patients and members, these are the kinds of questions that I would ask and kind of gauge so as to not even send them to an imaging center or to a diagnostic place. I would want them to go to, you know, the cardiologist and a specific cardiologist and someone who I feel very comfortable with. And I could call and have a discussion and say, this is why I'm worried about that particular person. And these are their symptoms and come up with the plan. And that plan, if, if they're having those symptoms, it wouldn't even include like a stress test at that point. They would maybe go a little bit more for something diagnostic, like again, the coronary CTA. And even so that doesn't, that's not a test that you could intervene. They may even need like the real deal where they do what's called like the formal angiogram is, and that's the test where people see the cardiologist and they go through either the wrist or, or the groin and they're able to like see where the blockage is and actually treat it with a stent or open up the vessel. But again, this would be a plan that I would make with the cardiologist. So, and, and you get a lot of this information like from, from these monitors, but again, the monitor is helpful. The monitor is also very helpful in that it will detect things like atrial fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia. It will detect if your heart rate stays elevated for you know, too long and, and too fast for too long, which is, could be something called ventricular tachycardia. These are all, you know, scary diagnoses. So these monitors are, are very helpful and, and really they're revolutionizing medicine and our ability to access this information quicker and get, get patients to the right places as soon as possible. Yeah. So, you know, going back to some of the earlier stuff you've talking about in terms of kind of the cost of concierge medicine, because hearing that discussion, the value jumps off the page to me, if you will, thinking about how valuable it would be to have an advocate who can interpret your current situation, help guide you to the right doctors and help advocate for a plan that gets implemented relatively quickly. Uh, I have a couple of statistics here that I'd love to share with you and then uh, get your reaction. So the concierge medicine market in the U.S. was valued at $6.1 billion in 2022, and it's expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of over 10% between 2023 and 2030, which is pretty spectacular growth rate for an industry. We talked a little bit about some of the factors that are influencing that and the trends in terms of you know, the current challenges in the insurance space, but what uh, what do you think concierge medicine looks like in a decade, given the technology we're talking about, artificial intelligence, perhaps that can come and support some of this data analysis? Uh, how do you envision your practice looking in a decade? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that concierge medicine will continue to boom. I mean, that's why I basically left the emergency department. Again, my background is in the emergency department, which will always be there. There will always be, you know, a need to access care 24 seven. And there's, there is job security in the emergency department. They're typically overwhelmed, long wait times, unpleasant, and usually understaffed. I mean, there's, there's a lot of job security in that field. I, I think though concierge medicine is just the better way and the more enjoyable way to practice medicine. It's much more satisfying um, I, I think it will continue to evolve. I mean, so I'm doing concierge internal medicine and really that's because my patients like want a relationship and a bond and a trust. And, uh, you just, you're not going to get that through traditional medicine, whether it's taking too long to see your doctor or they're not available after 5 PM, but I think it's going to evolve and expand into subspecialties. So we already mm -hmm. see this in Palm beach. Now there are concierge cardiologists, gastroenterologists, spine surgeons, like there are well-established uh, specialists who are on call at a hospital who will also have 
a concierge component to their practice. And it's, you know, it, and I learned this at Solace. I mean, this is for people who value their value their time more than they value their money, or better said, maybe their time is their money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's if you want access to healthcare, the way that the state of medicine currently is, you kind of have to go the concierge route. I mean, there's other ways to do it. You could have a family member who's a doctor, friends. There are the occasional primary care doctors who still are very traditional and old school who take this, you know, take this the way it used to be, have a relationship, give out their cell phone. That that can't be a very long shelf life, you know, just with the way the insurance companies are and the, and the state of affairs. So it, it's just a reality that if if a patient wants to have access to healthcare, and again, advocacy, care coordination, care navigation, follow up, follow through, a phone number to call, it, it's going to have to come at a price, and that's really joining a membership based practice. Now again, young healthy, no meds, no allergies, you know, see the doctor once a year. Does that person like need a concierge doctor? Like probably not depending, you know, what that person will typically do have a primary doctor. They'll go to the doctor maybe once a year, maybe even not. And, and then, you know, they end up in an urgent care, they go to an ER and, and that may be all that they need for, for the year or two. But if somebody like, again, wants to be proactive, and that's where the longevity component comes in. If people are, you know, educated about this topic and, and they really want to stay ahead of their health, then the concierge medicine component comes in because you need a partner. Like you need to have a healthcare partner. And again, some of this, most of this is not covered by insurance. A lot of this is desired. Cancer screenings and MRIs, it's not covered. So the patient has to literally say, like, I am willing to pay out of pocket. And, you know, I could share stories of, of a 37-year-old who was getting mammograms because, you know, she wanted to know and, and they picked up breast cancer. Now, that wouldn't have been done through a traditional practice. Uh, the insurance company isn't going to pay for it. And there are just people that want to know this. But again, it's kind of like that story you told us about the MRI. They're one-offs. So it's, again, like, you know, how much stake and value do you put in that? And people really should value, you know, value their health because you really have to start looking at these things early. That's that's the message from like these longevity specialists who are extremely, like I said, they're like popular. They're like celebrities these days, speaking engagements, they're sold out. The message is like by the time you see the problem on lab, on CAT scan, on x-ray, you probably missed the boat already. So the time to be proactive is before it develops. And, and that's really where we're headed. And, and you need, you kind of need a concierge partner in that. Now I'm going to take it even further. There are companies that I know we, you, we both know about that have taken this to the umpteenth level and tens of thousands of dollars, and they will screen everything and anything. That's a whole different like topic for another day. Um, so again, what I'm doing and what you're seeing right now with this boom like the, this, the data you point out with like the value of concierge medicine and expanding over time. I think that's just referring to kind of what I'm doing in their tradition, like a concierge medical practice in the traditional space. Again, there are these other programs that have taken it much, much to a further extreme and they're very expensive and elaborate, but I don't, I don't even think it's referring to that. I think it's referring to more of what, what we're discussing. Yeah. So I've seen some data that suggests that the average annual cost for kind of the high end concierge medicine is between one hundred and one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Do you think that is a, a fair assessment if you're looking to stay fully ahead? Right. It's your goal is longevity with great health span and you're willing to pay. Is that a, a fair range? Uh, it, it's much cheaper than that. I mean, there are doctors that will charge that in certain markets. You're talking like in, in certain places in California and New York, you ha will have an occasional doctor that can charge that much. Traditionally, it's it's a couple of thousand dollars a year to have access to your doctor. I mean, I would say the ranges are, and again, I don't know this specifics of this, but you're talking like it's two per member. It's like $2,000, $6,000, I would say is, the average range in the country in the market that I'm in, in, in Palm Beach, I would say it's more like, you know, 3,000, 3,500. It can go up here to 50,000, but
but I would say the average in this market is probably 7,500 to 10,000 where I live in Parkland and I would say Parkland Boca, I'd say it's cheaper there. Maybe the average is on the range of four to 5,000, maybe even less. It just changes because New York city and Beverly Hills, they're going to be a different price point, but a, it's not on the order of a hundred thousand. You will occasionally have um, a doctor that will charge that, and they're going to have very few patients. I mean, they're going to limit their practice size to a smaller sample, and it's going to be people that they really just have said, "I'm going to take care of these families, and my job is to make sure that that family or two is healthy." But I think for most people, it, it's—I hate to say—it's like, "Oh, concierge medicine is affordable to everybody." It, it's not. And it's sad. And it's like the reality, like the few thousand a year per person, it's not affordable to everybody, but um, it's not overpriced to the extent that um, it's something that most people can't attain. And I think, you know, having a concierge doctor saves money in other ways. I mean, literally the other night I had a phone call with a, a member whose son had croup at like four in the morning and they have my cell phone and I called him and I walked him through it and we did a FaceTime. And he literally told me he was like a few minutes away from going to the ER and the kid is fine. I, I don't know exactly the extent of his insurance, a high deductible, how much an ER visit costs. But, you know, you go to the ER for that. You, you could pay several thousand out of pocket based on your deductible, whatever they're going to bill you. So uh, on some levels, I, I think there may be some data that it could save you some money in certain situations by having that doctor to you know, treat you over the phone, treat you virtually, telemedicine, walk you off the ledge, talk you through a situation, tell you you don't need to go to the doctor, see you in the office the next day. So on many levels, uh, I would argue that concierge medicine can save money. Now, again, I realize they're coming to the table to join as a member, but I think in the long run, if done right, and you have an honest doctor, you could probably save money. Yeah. I mean, I think it intuitively, preventative care seems to be a path forward for both individuals saving money, gaining better health outcomes, and for society writ large to you know save money because the amount of money that's spent on acute care, end of life treatment, things like that is astronomical. Um, so I fully am buying in to the idea of concierge medicine, particularly in the sense that you know you can look at the large population and say, oh, for some people, the majority of people, they won't catch anything. But ever, but for the people that do, oh my goodness. I mean, the, the difference is life and death perhaps. And so therefore yeah. it's hard to advocate for you know a system that only catches it in tests when it's perhaps too late. Yeah. 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 I mean, the advocacy is huge. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest components. I mean, anybody who knows me knows I will do anything for my patients and members. I, I did that as best I could in the emergency department as well. But again, I was limited by the volume and the time constraints, but the advocacy component and just having like a healthcare partner is, is enormous. You, you don't necessarily see that when you sign up, it's something you will gain in value over time. Yeah. And time is an interesting concept. You talked a little bit about um, one of the benefits of concierge medicine is time. Uh, I think about that in my own business, how we desire to give our clients their time back. Maybe could you talk through a little bit about that angle and why you feel that there's an, a, a patient is gaining time by working with a concierge doctor? Because I think that's an important concept that we could uh, spend a little bit more time, so to speak. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. It's a great topic. And I will say like one of the things that my previous position at Salas Health, we have provide like personnel and a team that was dedicated to making appointments and doing like a lot of the legwork, which being on hold with the doctor's office, calling, being persistent, getting them an appointment. You know, when someone is a member of a concierge practice, the expectation is you're, you're going to, you're not going to cut the line over somebody who's sick and you know, I, I don't want my members to think like, you know, if they have a cardi, I'm going to take away the cardiology appointment from someone who's in distress with chest pain, but I'm going to do what I can to get my patient in with that cardiologist as soon as possible. And, and you technically, you know, you pick and choose the, the battles and the importance. And, you know, the members and the patients, they're, they're nice, genuine people. They, 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 under, they understand, they get it. 
And, um, you know, when someone needs to be seen, I pick up the phone, I call the doctor who I have a relationship with. And I don't say like, oh, can you cancel your four o'clock? I have, you know, Mr. Jones who needs to see you, but they will stay late for me to see one more. And, you know, it's vice versa. I will help them when the situation arises as well. So having that relationship with, you know, the doctor to go above and beyond for you is, is huge. Um, the way I would love to structure our practice and the way we do it here is we call the physician's office ahead of time to kind of pave the path for the patient, see what the waiting was like, see when the next available appointment is. Again, you have to try to do it tactfully and have gentle persistence. You don't want to come in, be obnoxious and arrogant and try to flex your muscle, but you want to do it in a way that, you know, is with respect where you're treating that the consulting physician with respect, your patient with respect. And typically like, you know, you're, the patients understand. I have a patient who needs to see a cardiologist. She just recently signed up. She has a genetic mutation that needs uh, like follow-ups. And uh, it's, not, uh, it's not urgent or emergent. And this particular cardiologist who I like, he's booking into December. I was like embarrassed to call her and say, hey, I got you an appointment in December. Like, good news. You know, you paid this money to be my private patient, concierge. And I got you an appointment in three months from now. It just, it doesn't sound like concierge. But I actually called her and I said, you know, this doctor I really want you to see is booking out several months. I could look into other options. I could pick up the phone and make a call. And she said, look, it's, not, it's, it's routine. Just get me on the list for December. I'll go then. I mean, it was like, I, here I was like a little bit shy about telling her this or presenting it to her. And she was totally receptive and was like, look, I don't want to take anybody's appointment from them. It's not an emergency. Just give me December. But you see, it just involved a conversation. And, and that's, you know, but a conversation involves time. And we're talking about time. And most people like in their practice don't have the time. So, uh, you know, that's really like the nice part of, of concierge medicine is that you limit and you cap it so that you have time to give patients, you know, to develop, to devote to the patients. And, and these things are time consuming, being on hold for a doctor's office, waiting for the staff, waiting for the office manager, calling about a cancellation. It, it, all, it all just involves like time and persistence. Yeah, it all adds up. And so if we're talking a little bit more about longevity, we've talked about some of the kind of tests that you can look at to kind of manage care to achieve longevity. What are some of the other ways in which a concierge doctor can help a patient if their goal is to achieve, um, you know, a long, healthy life? Yeah. So some of the things you could really do, and I try to do this, is I check in with my own members about how's your weight loss program going or how's that exercise regimen that we discussed two weeks ago going or, you know, next time they come for an appointment, you could say, you know, we could go for like a walk around the block as we, you know, because because we have the time for longer appointments. But, you know, just reaching out and staying on top of things like weight loss, exercise, good sleep habits avoiding stressful situations, taking yourself out of like a bad situation, giving nutrition advice, you know, just inquiring about like family events and just, just like building that trust and relationship and showing that you're not just like there to tell them like lose weight, eat better, sleep better, but, you know, ask the questions and build, you know, build that trust with them, but really encouraging them to like make appropriate changes to their lifestyle that that will take you further than anything you know if people want to like hold off dementia and nerve you know it comes down to cognitive exercise so you know you really have to push this and enforce this i have some members like you know that you know they they love they're in the restaurant business i mean how do you tell them to like eat healthier when they're in the restaurant business and they either own or they're connected to some of the you know five star restaurants it's very challenging so you really got to just, you know, push the exercise on them and the activity and tell them that, you know, wearing something like the heart rate monitor or counting your steps or, you know, don't sit around all day or get a desk where you stand or encouraging them to move. But you really, I, I think that, you know, just being their healthcare partner and their advocate and just kind of getting to know them personally and encouraging, you know, good behaviors will go a long way too. Because you could look at these tests, again, cancer screening, blood tests. It's it's the day to day that people will let their guard down, and you just and and I'm not saying like don't don't enjoy a meal or eat a burger or get a slice of pizza. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just you know trying to reinforce you know in, in general or overall, just make a better decision or two you know this week than than last week. Just do a little bit more you know exercise next week than than the week prior. 
So just encouraging them to kind of stay ahead of their health and stay active. How important is exercise in achieving a long health span? I mean, is that more important than nutrition? Is that more important than, you know, seeing the concierge doctor and getting your tests? Yeah, I, I would say right now, I think the theory is that exercise is a lot more important than nutrition. I think probably 10 or 15, maybe 20 years ago, I think people were the belief that nutrition was the most important. I, I think right now the feeling is that exercise is probably a much more important um, factor in staying healthy. And people who exercise and maintain a, you know, a good cardiac index and could walk and they don't get short of breath, they maintain good oxygen levels, they don't carry the excess weight, they don't put themselves at risk, say, for like early onset diabetes or what we call the metabolic syndrome. I think that, you know, that's really the bigger one. One of the things we didn't mention, and we could we could look at exercise, we could look at nutrition. Genetics are a huge factor in this. And that's like the great unknown. I mean, there were just certain people who their parents and their grandparents may live to 90 to 100 and not have any medical issues. Those people seem to have a genetic advantage. And that's kind of where some of the blood tests come in. Like if you know that you have maybe not a genetic advantage, but perhaps a genetic disadvantage, you know, having high cholesterol at a young age or family members who've had heart attacks at a young age, they're the ones that really need to go for these objective tests. And, and even so, that's like the one thing you cannot escape. Like you cannot escape or modify your family history. You know, if you're, if you're 50, and I use that number, I don't know why, maybe because I'm close to 50. But you're 50, and let's say you're healthy. If you're a woman, healthy, no medical problems, no diabetes, and you tell me that your mother had a heart attack at 50, that trumps everything. It trumps everything. Even if you're diabetic, high cholesterol, smoker, forget all that. If you're a 50-year-old female and you tell me that your mother had a heart attack at age 50, and, you know, you get chest pain that goes to your arm, and it's pressure, and it's squeezing, and you're nauseous, it's like game over. It doesn't matter how good your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your diabetes are. That family history will really trump it all. Yeah. I was I was getting visited by my three dogs while uh, you were talking there. I don't know if you could see the, the camera shaking or anybody yeah. jumping in, but oh, yeah, yeah. they keep me exercising by demanding many, many walks a day. Uh, so when we're talking about exercise, though, let's drill down a little bit. What are the types. We talked a little bit about cardiovascular uh, exercise. How important is strength training relative to cardiovascular? Yeah, yeah strength training is important. I, I think it's probably um, getting recognized as a more important modality than it used to be. It is a big deal. Um, weights, deadlifts, things that you know provide a whole body exercise there probably is a lot more benefit than just like looking good at the beach. Uh, grip strength has been shown to correlate with like, um, you know, longevity and health and wellness. But I would just say exercise, like most of us have busy schedules. And if you have kids or work, I think any exercise is great. It's hard to make time. It, like exercise, you know, it shouldn't be a task. It really has to be a priority. And, you know, like I actually did exercise today, which I'm happy about. I woke up early. The alarm went off at six and I went into the I have a gym in the garage and, you know, I'm happy with today. But yesterday, you know, I, I hit snooze a few times and I did not exercise. And you know what? It's like I'm disappointed. Like at that moment, I was, you know, I just couldn't get out of bed. And later in the day, I was disappointed with myself. And today I'm much more satisfied with myself. But it really has to be a, a priority. It has to be built into the schedule. It shouldn't be looked at as a chore. It should be made a priority. And it's, it's, it's easier said than done because it's probably the first thing that most people scratch when like other things pop up into their life. And look, if there's a, a major commitment that comes up, I get it. But it really should be something that's almost like scheduled into your day and, and it should be a priority. Yeah, I, I understand that feeling. And I've, I've listened to a few experts and Jocko Willink, who I listen to his podcast often, gave me, uh, not directly me, but every one of his listeners, some guidance on that uh, snooze. He said, everybody wants to stay in a warm bed, yeah. but you got to get up. You got to roll out. And so I felt yeah. that this morning. I, I tend to get up between 4.30 and 5 in the morning to make sure that I get my workout in because I've yeah. got little kids 
And if I sleep in a second past six o'clock, there's no chance of it happening because they're demanding my attention yep. or food before they get out to the house. It's hard to get up early, but I've found to your point that it just slips. I can't get it no, into the rest of my day if I don't get it done first thing in the morning, which yeah, uh, people who have known me for a long time will be shocked that I could wake up at all, let alone early. Yeah. I was very into CrossFit for many years and I would go to 5 a.m. and my alarm would go off at 4.30 and my wife was also into CrossFit. She never went to the 5 a.m. But I was able to do it for a couple of years. I can't do it anymore and I won't try. I, it's just my I'm not wired like that anymore. Um, it has to be later. But for several years, it was that big of a commitment and a priority. But I just and actually I was talking with someone today because I made this transition like officially just a week ago and she asked me how it's going and I said, you know what? I've been exercising, so it's going well. And it's, it's that important for and it's not just for your physical health, it's for your mental health. And mm -hmm. it really goes a long way. It's 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 a big deal. And I think that exercise, I know we started this discussion about exercise versus nutrition. I think that the 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 emotional, mental, and psych psychological benefits to exercise aren't even appreciated. I mean, I was originally just thinking, oh, physically, and how do you feel or how do you look? Or it could definitely help your cholesterol and your blood pressure. But emotionally and psychologically, exercise is is enormous. Yeah. I feel better even just on the days I work out than on the days mm -hmm. I don't work out, let alone how much better I feel in periods of time when I'm working out regularly versus those times when it slips, whether it's, you know, perhaps laziness or sometimes an injury, uh, you know, and it takes you away from your routine, you know, you, you're, you're sick or you get some type of injury and you're unable to work out. It really affects me mentally. Yeah. Yeah. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. So, it, but you do have to do what's right for you. And so everybody's schedule is different, but as long as you're getting in some exercise, it's good. Uh, maybe a moment or two on sleep for a second. We talked about nutrition and, and exercise, but I'm I'm probably not paying enough attention to my sleep if I'm getting up that early. So what time should I be going to bed if I'm if I'm waking up at five? Yeah. It's it's funny you ask. I used to like say I will sleep when I'm dead. I mean, I was like <laughs> with work and I've had a few other jobs, like you know, part-time stuff and side gigs. I I was never a sleeper. And I used to say, I will, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And, you know, it's, it's undervalued. I wish I would, I wish I could take it back because sleep is, is really extremely important. And I actually, now I think my wife thinks, uh, you know, I'm losing it. I go to bed around 10, 10 30. And we were always like 11 30 midnight, wake up six, seven o'clock in the morning. I try to get in bed now and try to get like eight hours. It, it, I don't usually get eight. I, I'm more like seven. But I used to go on four or five hours and just bounce right back up. And, you know, the, the message I give my kids now, like, I, I wish I could take it back and have a do over because sleep is, you know, where our, you know, we restore, we, we regenerate. It's I, I read it, you know, something interesting. It's like sleep has never it, it's a part of every single like mammalian life pattern It's like every mammal sleeps and. Why has evolution not taken sleep out of the picture? Like there has mm -hmm. to be some benefit to sleep. And it's like you, the, un, the unfound benefits of it. I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface. I would say, look, you have to work, take care of your kids. They're young. You have a job. We can't sleep all day. I mean, I would love to just lay in bed, but it's, um, you know, I, I think you should shoot for seven, eight hours. I mean, eight hours is really ideal. Seven is more practical or realistic, but I, I think the answer is as much as possible. And, and this is a change from the way I used to think, because I used to, again, when people would say, oh, you must be tired. And I would just, you know, quickly, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And now I'm embarrassed to have said that because I realized it was the wrong answer. Yeah. Well, guilty as well. I've said that many a times. In fact, my kids have said that back to me when I've told them it's time to go to bed. They said, but dad, you used to say you'll sleep when you're dead. Why can't I? I know. Yeah. Uh, oh, unfortunate. You know, Ian, it's been an amazing conversation. Uh, the The podcast here is the Lumina Legacy podcast. And so a lot of the topics we're talking about here are designed to help the listeners think about legacy. How do they achieve it? How do they have a long lifespan so they can build a legacy? And I'm wondering, given your experiences, both 
now as a concierge doctor, but you know, critically as a emergency care doctor, you saw, you know, a lot of death and it's been present in your professional life. So I'm sure that you've thought of legacy. I'd say two questions to wrap up. One, how do you define the term legacy? And then what do you want your legacy to be? Yeah, I mean, I would think like your legacy is just how you're remembered or how people like the first few things that come to mind when people mention your name after after you're gone. And I will say, you know, I think that in 10 years ago, my legacy was, you know, being this badass ER doctor and, you know, I could intubate and put chest tubes and central lines and stabilize and resuscitate. And, and you know what, after all that, I could go out and play basketball and go to the gym and I was fine. That was my legacy was like, I was this efficient, hardworking, you know, had my, you know, had it all together, ER doctor and took care of patients. And now I could tell you, I made a career transition because, you know, I found that I was so focused on my career that I felt like I wasn't paying proper attention to my kids and to my wife. And now I would feel like I want my legacy to be different. So while I love being a doctor and having the relationship with my patients and that, you know, it's a huge priority to me, I made this career change and trying to go to a more structured lifestyle. Not, you know, part of it is to take care of my patients and have these relationships was so that my legacy could be that I was more available for my wife and kids because, you know, going into medicine, you know, you miss a lot of it. I mean, 20 years in, um, my oldest son, he's in college and he's, he's headed towards, he just started college. He's going to business. And I, I don't really want him in medicine because you give up a lot of time and some precious years and it's really, really a grind. And I'm not saying I would do it differently if I had to do it over, but I do have some regret that perhaps I, I wasn't around as much and wasn't available as much for my wife and kids. And I would hope that in this point in my career, the second phase of my career, that my legacy will be that I was more well-rounded and balanced and not only great to my patients, but also good to my family. A wonderful answer. It sounds like the concept of concierge medicine is going to give you back time to your own family as well as time to your patients so that they can give back to their family, which would really be the benefit of a better design system. So yeah. Ian, thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed the conversation and looking forward to talking again in the future and best of luck with growing the new practice. Thank you, Justin. It's my pleasure. Really enjoyed your time.